So, um, welcome to this talk about PHP Opcache, Real Podcast, and Preloading. So, we will be talking today about how we can tune our PHP installation. Um, and we will do that by uh, tuning PHP settings. So, new PHP versions always uh, get faster, but we can make them go even faster just by um, changing the things that we get for free. So, if we take a new version, they figure out some way of um, doing memory management a bit, uh, a bit better, so we get faster PHP versions. We saw that from 5 to, uh, to 7. And every minor version uh, since 7 got a, a little bit uh, faster. Um, so we have that straight out of the box, but we can also uh, improve it uh, so even more just by um, fine-tuning the settings of these, uh, of these new uh, features. So first, uh, some groundwork. Um, who doesn't know PHP? There's one, <laughs> okay. So um, PHP is a scripting language, as you will know. Um, and basically, it's a fire and forget language. So this means that um, we don't have any manual compilation step. So every time we type something, we go to a browser, we hit uh, reload, everything is getting compiled on the fly, and we see our new output. So this is the the groundwork we all are familiar with, uh, what PHP is. And then the second concept uh, um, for setting the stage is uh, PHP FPM. So who um, isn't using PHP FPM? I think, yeah, a few hands, but almost everybody is using FPM. It's the only relevant uh, SAPI nowadays. So um, what is FPM? We have a front-end uh, web server like uh, Apache or Nginx. And if we have a PHP, uh, PHP file that has to, be, uh, has to be executed, we forward that request to, a, uh, to the FPM. Um, so for instance, we, listen, we have a master process listening on port 9000. And every time a, a request comes in, the master process starts or looks if there are any child process, processes available. Um, and then um, creates one or just forwards it to the running, to the running child process. So just to keep in mind for the rest of the presentation, we have shared memory, and shared memory is located in the master process. So if you have child processes, the, sh the shared memory is, is, um, is uh, located in the master process. So this is really the concept of this shared memory. So here we have um, an example of the master process that's always running, and every time somebody goes to our website, we have a, uh, a child process running um, in the rare occasion that I have multiple visitors on my site, I have uh, more uh, processes. So um, yeah, you know, you, you, get the, you get the concept. So now this shared memory, what is this shared memory? Uh, so in computer hardware, shared memory refers to the block of random access memory that can be accessed by several different central processing units in a multiprocessing computer system. So what this means is every process has its own batch of uh, memory and the shared memory is shared over those processes. Um, so if we want to uh, save something and share it between the different processes, we use a shared memory. So this is the, uh, this is the groundwork for the rest of the, of the presentation. So all set? OK. Um, my name is Joachim Kudenis. Um, I'm a, a father. I started running like a couple of years, uh, like now a year, and uh, enjoying that very much. But more uh, relevant to this presentation is um, I'm the um, co-organizer of a local user group in Belgium. I'm a coach at our local Coder Dojo, where we teach uh, kids how to, uh, how to program and how to interact with uh, cool little robots and stuff. Um, and I'm a developer at Combel, uh, a web hosting company in, uh, in Belgium. So this talk is about performance, right? Yeah, you're right, this is all about performance. So, but why, do we, uh, why did I create this presentation? It's because at Combel, I'm part of the performance team. Um, so that's a, that's a special team which um, analyzes um, problematic websites from customers and uh, we do a deep dive in the, uh, in the code of the, of the customer. And we also have the knowledge of how our systems, uh, how our backend systems are set up. 
so we really know where to, where to look and where to spot uh, issues. Um, so here we have uh, the quotes, 80% of the performance issues have nothing to do with your server. So we really dive into, um, as a hosting company, we want to sell more servers, but sometimes we really have to optimize, uh, optimize the, uh, the code itself. And a lot of that uh, optimization is just by knowing how everything works under the hood and knowing where we can um, tune, uh, tune settings, but also how you write specific code. Um, so this is an example, it's a, a, pr a, a pretty uh, famous um, gist um, where, they, uh, where we have a, an overview of the different latency numbers. So at the top, we have the um, L1 and L2 um, caching from the, uh, from the CPU. And you see that every time we go a step further, so if we want to um, read stuff from memory, we are uh, a bit slower. If we want to, if you want to read a, a, mega, um, a megabyte from the hard drive, we're again a bit slower. If you want to add a uh, round trip to, the, uh, um, to a different uh, data center, everything gets slower. Thus so we want to keep everything as close to the, uh, to the uh, CPU as possible. Um, so this is more uh, a graphical visualization of that. So now that we know all the things that we want to, uh, that we want to change, how can we actually fix it? Uh, and uh, we see a lot of problems with disk I.O. And disk I.O., if you have a look at the uh, Linux uh, the Linux storage stack. Um, at the top there, you have our little uh, application. And every time we want to access the, uh, the disks, we go to the virtual file system. Uh, and there we have the uh, block-based file systems that we know, so like the, the local storage. Um, but at a hosting company, we, um, we use the network file system a lot because that's easier just to, uh, just to scale, do backups. But the problem there is um, we don't, uh, we don't, we're not only doing the file system lookup, but we also have to do a round trip to the, uh, to the network. So if you uh, slide this a bit up, you come, to, you come at the block layer, and then the block layer will um, talk to the, to the physical drives. Um, but in our, in, our, um, uh, in our setup, we use NFS, so the network file system. And the network file system has an, has, has an extra, we have all the, um, all the advantages of using the uh, NFS, but we have a, a new set of problems because instead of going from our user program to the file system uh, through the VFS, we have to go through the network and then go do again, uh, look at the uh, file system at the NFS server and then there um, take all the, uh, take all the uh, file information. So a lot of the things that we um, can optimize are located in that uh, and stopping that overhead of going over the, uh, over the wire. So we have, if you're familiar with NFS, you have NFS cache, which caches um, a lot of information on the client. But if we are using PHP, we want to have highly dynamic, we want to program um, with PHP, uh, we want to change our files, um, so we still uh, occasionally have to uh, travel that network uh, layer. So now that, that, I ha that I showed you all the, uh, uh, all the theoretical uh, information, how can we actually t uh, tackle all these challenges in, uh, in PHP? Um, and as the talk uh, title suggested, we have three topics that we use to, uh, to tackle all these, uh, all these problems. We have the real pod cache, the op cache, and then preloading. So let's dive into the real pod cache. So what the real pod cache is, um, it is a system in PHP uh, and it is used to reduce uh, I.O. So we want to eliminate the I.O. going to the file system as much as possible. And it does that by caching uh, all possible pods to a specific destination pod. So if we, um, if we use uh, Composer, uh, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of files that we want to load, and in our application, we do a lot of uh, relative paths, so like uh, dot, dot, slash, and then we go to a path. Um, instead of always calculating all those, uh, where, th where that specific file is living, um, it will explode, kind of explode on the, uh, on the path, 
the complete pod and store every uh, every uh, segment in a real pod cache so that um, so that it doesn't have to go to the file system every time it, it needs to find out where something is located so remember the shared memory I talked uh, I talked about the shared memory is located in the uh, parent process and the master process but real pod cache is not stored in shared memory it's it's uh, stored in the process memory so this means that <coughs> um, every time a child starts it has to rebuild the whole uh, the whole real pod cache which isn't that bad but if you if you see a lot of uh, problems with like cold starts of the of the process you just want to have at least one process always running so the real pod cache isn't um, isn't cleared so by default uh, we have 4 megabytes for that real pod cache to store um, but again, it's not stored in shared memory, so you have to uh, watch out. If you have like 200 uh, child processes, you have four megabytes times 200, so you have to watch out that you don't uh, run out of memory. So before PHP 7, the default was uh, 16K, and we all know that all the frameworks that we use, that's way too, that's way too low. So the new, um, the new default uh, is uh, four megabytes. And as I mentioned before, this helps a lot with uh, the NFS problem that we um, that we have. So try to keep um, uh, try to keep as much uh, uh, processes running to uh, to uh, avoid the overhead. So we have a couple of um, functions that we can use. We have the real pod uh, cache get, which just gives you a list of all the files that are uh, that are in the real pod cache. And we have the cache size, which just shows you the configured, uh, the currently configured um, size. There's also a real pod function, but this uh, and has nothing to do with real pod caching. It uses real pod caching under the hood, but it just calculates the actual um, destination pods of a specific um, relative pod. So a small demo. Um, I have this. Um, I have this file which. I try to access uh, three files on, on disk. So I have a relative one, the ffi.php. Then I have um, an absolute one. And then again, the, uh, another, um, another example of uh, a file loading. So if I open the real pod, uh, cache get, um, I first of all get my current working directory. So I have my home uh, directory. And then you can see that it stores all the, um, all the upper pods. So when some uh, when, uh, when another process uh, when another script is um, accessing something um, differently, um, most of the information is already is already there. So if we scroll down, we see that we have the relative path to the FFI, which maps to the absolute path, and then again we have the absolute path, which maps uh, uh, which maps uh, everything. So um, you can see that if you have a a framework, if you have a lot of files, this can get uh, quick, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite quickly. Um, but this helps a lot with the, with performance. So real pod cache, simple concept. There's a couple of things that we can tune. Um, we have some INI settings. So we have the size, which is four megabyte. Uh, we have the time to live. Uh, so time to live on the server, just put it, put it really high. It's not really that important. Um, if you're in development uh, and you want to uh, benefit from it, put it a bit lower. It's just a, it's just a, a small, a small time to live. Okay, so real pod cache, not that exciting. Um, just keep in mind that it's there, and you want to uh, keep the uh, master and, and child processes um, in check. So next up is opcache. Um, Who's not using opcache? Nobody, that means everybody is on a recent PHP version because opcache was just um, added uh, by default. Um, and what is opcache? It's, uh, it improves PHP performance by storing pre-compiled script bytecode and shared memory, thereby removing the need for PHP to load and parse scripts on each request. So a basic PHP request looks like this. Um, we have the PHP code and we want to execute that code. Uh, and first of all, we have a lexer and a parser which creates tokens. And that token, uh, those tokens are um, um, then available as an abstract syntax tree. 
And then we can use um, those tokens in a compiler. The compiler will generate upcodes, and those upcodes will go into a specific VM or a specific operating system, and then ex uh, will be executed to pr pr produce the, the results. So as I mentioned before, uh, PHP is a fire and forget. It's a throwaway language. So it always performs these, uh, these steps. Uh, it reads the PHP code, it lexes, uh, it creates tokens, then it compiles it and generates opcodes, and then it executes those opcodes. And once that's done, the request is served, all the information is discarded, everything is thrown away. So every request, we have to do that, we have to do that over and over again. So if we have a look, um, we have the abstract, abstract syntax tree, um, and then the next step is the op is the opcodes. But what uh, what are opcodes? So in computing, uh, an operation code is the portion of a machine language instruction that specifies the operation to be performed. So what does it mean in the context of PHP? If you want to have a look at what opcodes that are available uh, and what uh, opcodes that are being used in PHP. You can go to um, evolve.org, where you can run a lot of um, a lot of PHP scripts, and then um, yeah, run them over all the versions that are available. But there's also a little tab um, called a VLD, and that's short for the Vulkan Logic Dumper. And the Vulkan Logic Dumper um, generates a list of all the things that you are that your little script is doing, and shows you all the opcodes that are being uh, generated. So here you can see that we have a, uh, a echo, that we, that we have a, um, a jump if something, if, if the false is, um, is being true, uh, if false is false, then you go to the, to the next branch. So here are all the opcodes for, for this little script. So again, as you can imagine, this can get big very <laughs> fairly uh, quickly if you're using libraries or frameworks. Um, so, the, this is just the small, the small script, which is just to show you all the, all the opcodes, but this can get gigantic if you have, uh, if you have, a, lot of, uh, if you have a lot of files and codes. And most of the time, the, the opcodes don't change. First of all, if you're using Composer and you have a vendor directory, all the files in that vendor directory are not changing. Um, and if you are running a specific version of your application in production, you're not hopefully live editing files in production, so those opcodes, they don't, they don't change. So when things don't change, what do we do? We just add some cache in it. Um, and here is where opcache uh, comes, into, com comes into play. Um, and opcache um, comes from a long history of opcode cachers. So before we had opcache as part of the PHP uh, engine, um, we had APC. We had MMCache, we had the Zend Optimizer. So we had a bunch of uh, opcache, uh, opcode cachers that we, have to, that we had to enable uh, manually. Um, but um, as of version 5.5, 5 .5, Zend donated the, op the Zend Optimizer to, um, to, the PHP, to, to the PHP source. Um, and Zend Optimizer came from Zend Guard, which was uh, which was, or still is, a tool to uh, encode, your, uh, encode your PHP uh, files and then distribute them. Um, but they took out that optimizer part and just put it into, uh, into PHP. So this whole step, uh, this whole um, um, parsing and then compiling and then executing, if we add the cache, we just eliminate the, 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 first, uh, the first part of, the, of it. So all those opcache, uh, all those op opcodes are cached into the shared memory. Um, so they are, in the case of the FPM, all, all are stored in the uh, in the master process. So part of the opcache was uh, because it stems from Zend Optimizer. Um, part of the opcache uh, optimizer, uh, part of the opcache, sorry is the opcache optimizer. And um, that's a specific um, part of uh, opcache which um, gets better every time <coughs> there's a new release. And what it does, it, is, it, uh, it optimizes, um, 
it optimizes branches. It optimizes dead code. So if it sees that there's that there are some lines below a return, it will de uh, it will detect that and just throw away the opcodes instead of storing um, opcodes that aren't actually doing anything. And also small things like um, this notation. If you don't do this already with a, a static analyzer, uh, a static analyzer, the opcode uh, optimizer will just do it um, under the hood and save the better uh, way of doing it uh, in the op cache. So if we have a look at how that uh, how that actual um, results, so what you see here is we have the if false. So the first part is never is never executed. So all the um, all the parts of the uh, of the condition are just uh, not needed there. So what the op cache optimizer will do is just echo true and then assign something and then echo again and return. So you can see that this uh, reduces um, the opcodes in this example by half. Uh, but if you have a lot of, uh, if you have a lot of um, PHP, uh, uh, PHP files, this will uh, reduce all the opcodes uh, op uh, drastically. So now that we know what the opcaches are, um, what can we, uh, what functions do we have? So we have some functions um, to gather some information. So we have the get configuration, which just all the settings that are being uh, that are being uh, used. We have the opcache get status, which is the most important one to get all the information from. Um, I have an example later on. Then you have some. Um, you can pass a specific file to uh, to the S uh, cache to see if if it's stored in the in the opcache. And then we have some specific functions to, do, to, to take action. So there's a, um, there's a function compile file where we can manually say, take this file and um, store all the opcaches, so uh, calculate the opcodes and store them into, uh, into opcache. We can invalidate specific files. So this is, um, this is uh, handy if you're doing a release, a deploy, and you want to invalidate specific files so that they uh, get that the new opcodes are getting stored. Uh, and there's also the opcache reset, where it's just um, resetting the complete uh, the complete opcache, so all the all the files that are cached are being uh, are being destroyed. So again, small demo. Um, I have a small script which just does a, a printer of opcache get status, um, and what that gets us as a um, nice overview of everything that's happening uh, with opcache. Um, so we can see that opcache is enabled. The cache is not full. We have, not nothing, uh, re we have no restarts um, coming up. And then the most important part, uh, the memory usage. Here you can see if it's full or if, it's if, the, if, the, if the opcache is nearly full. We have um, the wasted memory marker. Uh, more on that later. Then we have the intern strings. Um, that's also a, um, a trick to get our upcodes a bit uh, a bit smaller. Also more on that later. And then the most important part is the up, uh, is the op opcache statistics. So here you can see that we um, have only one script because we are executing it from the command line. We only have one script that's being cached. Um, we have a number of, uh, we have no hits because this is the first time that we execute this. And then we have some uh, restarts. So also again, uh, more on that later. Um, and we have no hits and one miss because this is the first time that we execute it. And if we do it on the command line, if we execute it again, we again will not have a hit because there's no shared memory. Um, and uh, a very important one, if you execute this on your, uh, on your web server, you will see here the opcache hit rate, um, and now it's zero. But if you are running in production, you really want a opcache hit rate of 99.99, uh, because the moment it drops, this means you have uh, changing files. That means you, ha you don't, you know, you're not um, having a very uh, optimized way of running opcache. Um, and then if you um, if you ask to include all the scripts that are being in the opcache, you get a list of all the uh, of all the um, of all the keys, and then some statistics about the specific files. 
So, um, I talked about the inferred strings, and this is something that's being used in a lot of languages. Um, it's available in PHP since 5.4, and it's some kind of compression for source code. So, if, if you have a lot of uh, the same, um, the same opcache um, combinations that are coming, um, that are, that are uh, occurring a lot, you can just compress that so that you have an even smaller footprint in, in the memory of all the opcodes. Um, and the inferred strings block um, is a part of the uh, complete memory block that you reserve for the, for the opcache. So if this block is full, you will just uh, use more memory than, um, than is needed, but um, again, that's also stored in the, uh, in, the shared file mem uh, in the shared memory of the master. You see a lot, um, you see the keys uh, thing a lot in the, um, in, the, in the statistics, and this is just the, the, the full path and all the different relative paths again to a specific file. So if, you, if, you, if we go back here, uh, these are just all the keys. This specific file has been compiled into, opca into opcache and is uh, accessible through that key. Um, the next thing that we saw in the, uh, in the statistics output was the wasted memory. So by default, opcache doesn't do any defragmentation. So um, opcache was built for performance. So we have, um, so let's say we don't have anything in opcache and we start PHP. We have two files and we put it in opcache. And then PHP sees that the file has, 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 been, has been modified. So instead of re, uh, replacing the opcodes in memory for that previous entry, it just marks that previous entry as wasted and then adds the new compiled file uh, at the end of the, of the memory. And that's just done so that it doesn't um, uh, lose computation over, uh, for, uh, for cleaning up that memory. But if you have a lot of changing files, you have a lot of memory that's being marked as wasted. And sometimes um, uh, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of files uh, um, that are being invalidated. And if you have a lot of wasted memory, instead of, um, instead of cleaning up that memory, opcache just resets itself. So it does a restart. So again, it starts from a clean slate and everything is, um, is filling up again. Um, so yeah, if files change, they cause re recompilation. And we have a, 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 a couple of, a couple of uh, scenarios where the opcache is, uh, is restarting. So if we have a lot of wasted memory, um, so first of all, if the opcache is full and we don't have any wasted memory, then the opcache will just be full. It won't do a, a restart, it, it will just try to um, Add some more uh, files to the uh, to the opcache, but it will see it is full, and it will just not add it to the to the to the uh, to the opcache. Um, if we have a lot of changing files, and we um, reach a specific percentage of wasted uh, of wasted files, it will do an out of memory restart. Um, so if you are uh, monitoring your uh, sites and you see a lot of uh, OOM restarts, it's just because you have a lot of changing files and you want to do something about that. The hash restarts are just if you have too many files and um, you have a limit on the number of keys that you can store. If you have too many files that you want to store um, and, it, and the opcache sees that, it, that that's, there's no, no, no place anymore, it will also trigger a hash restart so that, that it can start again with new, uh, adding new files. Again, you don't want uh, hash restarts. And then the last one is just the, method I, uh, the function I told you, uh, I, I showed you before the opcache uh, reset, and that all add that uh, are the manual restarts. Um, so again, we're as, a ho as a hoster, we're monitoring um, all, these, all these settings, uh, and there's an example of a WordPress plugin trying to do an upgrade and then um, doing an opcache reset because there are new files, so they did a reset. Uh, but we saw a upgrade loop um, we saw an upgrade that's, that was failing constantly, so we saw the loop, and we saw uh, in our statistics that there were a lot of manual restarts, uh, and that's something you can have a manual restart once a day if you deploy new code, 
or if you deploy more, whatever. But you can't if you have uh, if you have uh, 300 restarts in, in five minutes. There's something there's something going on. So I, I showed you the restarts. Um, don't ever uh, have a full cache. Um, so if you have an, uh, if, if you don't have any memory left, and uh, Opcache is trying to compile your code and store all those upcodes into the cache, you will actually have done more work. Than, uh, than you will uh, um, than before, because you will have done all the extra work. Then you want to check if you want to put it into, into the cache, and then you have to discard that information. So you actually added a new step, uh, uh, added a new um, uh, uh, step in the way, which makes it even slower. Um, so never, never have a full cache. Um, Whenever we see sites that are having problems, the first thing I do is I check the upcodes, uh, I, I check the statistics, and nine out of ten is just a full cache, and it, um, uh, it's, it's much better if we just uh, double the amount of memory that us, that's allocated to it. So this was um, this was the part of the opcache um, itself, um, and we have another concept because now we're storing everything into memory. Um, but there's also something um, which is called opcache file cache, and instead of uh, when the process starts, reading the PHP files from memory, compiling them, and then storing them into the opcache, um, we can store the opcache, uh, the opcodes into a file, and then the moment PHP starts, it will just take those uh, that the, the, the those opcodes and then put them directly into uh, into opcache. So this this can help uh, busy sites. Uh, for instance, if you um, do a reload and you have a lot of visitors. And instead of doing everything compiling uh, on the fly uh, when they arrive, you can just copy it over from the uh, from the from the files directly into the opcache memory. And it also helps um, with uh, the CLI. So, in the example and the demo example uh, before, it just starts uh, every time it it's, it starts the, uh, the the process. It has to read the PHP file from disk, compile it, store it, in, uh, store it into opcache if we want to, uh, and then throw it away. And if we store it into files, the PHP, um, the console, uh, can just start it based from those uh, from those uh, uh, from those opcache files. Um, and we only need uh, we only need to add one um, setting, and that's just a user directory. So here we have the file cache. We want to store it in the uh, in that folder, and then some uh, extra checks. Uh, but the, the important one is the first one. So if we <coughs> run that on a command line, we first have to say enable CLI because by default uh, opcache is not uh, is not supported on the um, on the uh, on the command line. Um, and then add the file cache that we want to uh, that we want to store and run everything. Again, it's the same file as before, um, and. If we then have a look at the uh, at the cache, we have a uh, we have a hash and then the complete tree, tree where we store the opcache and the binary file. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's another thing you can do with uh, with opcache. Um, there's a cool example in a PHP architect um, article where they also deep dive into the opcodes and uh, to the opcache uh, and um, they're trying to use the compiled files as a way of distributing packages, uh, of distributing PHP, so that you have like pre-compiled PHP. Um, it's a nice way of investigating opcache. Don't use it uh, in production, or don't use it uh, to, uh, yeah, to um, distribute distribute your PHP code. Um, so now that we know what opcache is and what all the possibilities are, uh, what can we tune? Um, so we have, like I said before, we have some disaster recovery scenarios. Is your memory full? Is your uh, is the intern strings parts full? Um, is the key store full? You just have to check all those um, all those scenarios um, by yeah, just getting all the st uh, getting the status from the from the real uh, FPM processes. And then fine-tune everything that you that you see. You want to double the memory. You want to give it more. Uh, you want to give some more um, intern strings um, space. 
Um, but also, if you see a lot of restarts, um, dive into the codes, see why, why, why those things happen. Maybe they are generating new PHP files and that they, uh, on the fly, for instance, and that they have to load. Uh, Opcache will also do a lot of, um, give a lot of um, warnings if, if, this, if this happens, um, because you will see that you won't have the hit rate that, that we want. So we have some, uh, we have some uh, configuration settings that we can, that we can fine tune. So first of all, in the memory, we have the memory consumption, and this is the block that Opcache will be uh, will be dedicating for the uh, for the process uh, for the FPM to to be using. So I think by default it's uh, 46 megabytes. Uh, it depends on the application if you need more, if you uh, if you need less. Then part of those of that 40 uh, 46 uh, megabytes will be the buffer to store the internal strings, so that you can uh, fine tune too. Uh, and then the, um, uh, how many files that are actually being um, uh, allowed to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be saved. So this depends also on the U limits of your uh, Linux systems, uh, uh, of your Linux system, um, but um, yeah, just make sure all the files that you have fit into that, uh, fit into that uh, max. And then for invalidation, we have a flag where we can say that we want to have opcache validate the timestamps of the files that, is, that, uh, that, that, uh, that's, that exist in cache. So, um, for instance, we have a file, we are, uh, we are, we are chasing the file, and uh, on, if we say validate timestamps on, then every time before fetching the opcodes from, uh, from the cache, um, it will do a stat to the file system and see if the uh, if the modified time is newer than what's in than what's in cache. Um, in development, this is great. Um, you can even say the revalidate frequency. So, like every two seconds, have a look if it's if it if it's changed. Um, in production, you could say that you only want to revalidate every 60 seconds, but that's also a bit strange because you know exactly when you're deploying. Uh, we mostly um, uh, recommend to just say validate timestamps uh, off, because if you do a stats, if you use the NFS, you have to uh, still do the complete network, um, uh, go through the complete network layer just to see if the file was modified on the NFS server. Um, so we recommend just turning uh, validate timestamps uh, off and then just restart the opcache the moment you know you deployed a new, uh, a new version of your site. Um, and you can also configure the threshold of the max wasted uh, memory. So I think by default it's 5%. So the moment that the uh, opcache sees that 5% of the memory is being wasted, it will just do a restart. Um, so yeah, to avoid having a lot of restarts, just put it smaller, but on the other hand, just make sure you don't have any wasted memory. Try to figure out why the wasted memory was there in the first place. So we get stats by using get status, um, and the get status is uh, good for parsing it into something else, and then um, yeah, have some visualizations. So this is, there, there are a few projects where, where we have a single PHP file. So we can just um, take that PHP file and put it in our uh, directory, in our um, web server directory, um, and it will use all the information from uh, the get status to show you how many memory you have, how many hits you have versus uh, versus misses. Um, so you have some uh, you have some more information. It's very important that this page is being served from the same FPM pool that you want to investigate, because if you run get status on a command line, that's just the status from the command line and nothing to do with the with the FPM. Um, so just make sure if you are monitoring that you uh, monitor the correct, uh, the correct process. So this is an example. You have another example where you can see the different restarts, where you can see uh, yeah, the stats of the memory. So it's all based on the same information. It's just different, um, different views. So I mentioned the um, revalidation stuff um, and what you can do. So 
we, if we want to deploy a new version, we want to avoid that all the new customers, uh, all the new visitors are trying to compile all, that, all those uh, opcodes and then uh, putting them all in the, in the opcache. So we can do some kind of priming, um, and we can do that by, um, for instance, we deploy a new version, and then um, because we want to restart a specific, or we want to um, invalidate a specific opcache from an FPM, we have to, um, for instance, do a web call to a hidden script or a password protected script, which on his uh, on, on, on its turn uh, tries to modify the um, the current opcache. So we have, for instance, we do a push. We know what files have been changed and have been deployed, and then we can, um, for instance, get a list of all the changed files, uh, push that to a uh, to a, uh, a hidden file, and then ask the the file to um, to compile all the new all, all the changed files. Um, most of the time, they just do a callback to a PHP file that's on the server, which on his turn just say FPM reset and everything is uh, is is, uh, is emptied. But if you have a busy site, you can use different FPM pools. So we have a like I showed before, we have a FPM master with different with different um, clients, uh, with different childs. Um, and if we deploy a new version, we can create a new FPM pool which we then um, yeah, prime a bit by uh, going to some sites on that specific pool. And the moment the, uh, the, uh, F the new FPM pool has been primed, we can then uh, point the Nginx or Apache, the, uh, which it says in front, to the, new, uh, to the new port, and we have a fully primed opcache. Um, so we don't have any downtime, we don't have any spikes in uh, visitors trying to, op try to cache all the opcodes. Or we can use preloading. So preloading um, is something uh, is something new um, in, in PHP 7.4. So preloading preloads PHP functions and classes once, and uses them in the context of any future request without overhead. So magic, <laughs> everything, it's magic. So it is basically opcache on steroids. So um, if you look at uh, um, preloading, it is part of the opcache because it is just uh, an optimized way of, uh, of storing those uh, opcache. Um, and what it basically does, if you start an FPM server and you have preloading uh, configured, before accepting any requests, it will, will preload um, your application in a way that you, uh, that you want it to be preloaded. So, this loads the code into memory permanently, um, so we don't, have any, we don't have any overhead of copying it from the shared memory to the process memory and then doing stuff with it. So if we compare it to opcache, we, in opcache we have opcodes stored on a file-based uh, in, in, in file uh, way. So we have file X, so we have um, the, um, um, the class um, animal, um, and we store all those opcodes into, uh, into the shared memory, and then we have the uh, subclass uh, cat, and then we store all those opcodes into memory. But every time that we want to use the, uh, the cat uh, class, we have to um, fetch those opcodes from the memory, and then um, construct the, um, the complete object, um, and glue every, every, all the classes together. So, what preloading does, it, is, it helps with all those, uh, with all those class, uh, class libraries. So it helps with, um, with all the opcaches, uh, opcodes that are already being uh, generated, and then stores them in a, in, a specific, uh, in a specific way that we don't have any overhead. Um, and what this basically does is it will, um, your own code will be as performant as the native PHP, uh, the, the native PHP functions, because it's just uh, it was been stored into memory before accepting any uh, any any requests, and it does that by a simple uh, a simple file with some loading magic. Um, so the configuration here, we only have one configuration option, and that's opcache.preload, 
where we just um, uh, specify the path to a specific, uh, to a specific file. Um, and that file will be executed. So that's the only thing it will do. Um, it will start FPM. It will see the opcode, uh, the opcache preload. It will execute that file. Once that file has been completely executed, it will, be, it will start uh, accepting, um, accepting requests. So what you want to do in that preloading file is just get a list of all the files that you want to preload and then run them uh, through co uh, opcache compile file so that they are stored in the, um, in the opcache. And then just that script exits, and from that moment, all the things that you have been that you loaded into the uh, preload.php file uh, will be will be available for all the for all the future requests. So as I mentioned, we have the uh, cat and the uh, and the animal file. You have to make sure that you do that in the correct in the correct order, uh, because if some classes can't be constructed, they will just be discarded from the preloading and. Um, it won't be in memory, so it will still have to load them every time. Um, so preloading in the wild, uh, we have two examples. We have a, a Laravel example, which they, um, they try to tackle the preloading problem. Um, and in PHP, uh, in Symfony, since 4.4, so there's a blog post about it. Since 4.4, they're already using the knowledge that they have in the, uh, in the dependency container um, to generate a file with classes that you probably want to preload because they know uh, they, they know all the files that you want that you want to that you want to use. So they use you can't see it really well. So they have the varcache dev and they have a dot preload dot php file. And every time you compile the complete uh, container, that file will be present since 4.4. So if you want to start using it, you just add that file to your um, to your uh, preloading. Uh, in a setting. Um, so there are some uh, things that you have to keep in mind. We have a um, we have a dot any setting, so it's a complete server. So if you are doing multiple um, applications in a single server, um, this won't work because the preloading is for a complete is for a complete uh, installation, um, and you don't have any functions to reset the preloading um, to reset the preloading memory so because it is a um, um, a file which is uh, executed before we start accepting request you have to do a full restart to empty the memory uh, of the of the server so you really um, have to keep have to keep that in mind so when we talk about all the files that we use composer knows what files we were using right um, so the moment that the preloading RFC and PHP was available, there was a um, preloading support RFC and Composure, where um, a lot of excitement, uh, a, lo a lot of exciting people were. We know what files that we want to load because we are uh, doing all the dependencies. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it's a bit tricky. Composure doesn't really. Composure knows all the dependencies you want, but it doesn't really know. Um, what files you actually are using. So um, there are some, th there were some benchmarks on this um, on this uh, link, and there were benchmarks doing um, execute w without preloading, then preloading of the hot classes, and the hot classes are just um, a trick where we uh, get the status of all the uh, of all the files that are being in the opcache, and only use those files because. Composure has a lot of uh, files everywhere, but you're not using all those PHP files. So by doing this trick, you only uh, take the um, uh, take the files that are actually being used in the opcache. And then they also had a benchmark where they just took all the took all the files, and they did that by requiring the complete uh, class map. So if you have a look at the um, at the results, so um, only the hot files we have like 900 ish. And if you took all the files that are available in Composure, you have almost 15,000 uh, files. Um, so because the preloading.php happens before the server starts accepting uh, requests, you see that the more files you put in there, the longer it takes for the server to, to actually boot. Um, and if you do only the hot classes, 
the overhead isn't, isn't that much. The same for the memory. You see that we're only uh, almost using 105 megabytes uh, of memory to load all the classes that, we don't even that we're not even using. And then if you have a look at the request per seconds, um, you can see that the hot class preloading is, is the way to go. Um, beside the fact that this is a very active topic and there's a lot of contributions, um, um, they're not really um, eager to start doing it. So you're welcome to keep the discussion here as a central point. Uh, but to be clear, I'm fairly co confident that in the near future, we are not going to add anything to Composer. Um, if in a year or so, it turns out uh, that there's something Composer is uniquely positioned to really help with this, auto, uh, this preloading, then we can have another look. But um, for now, we see that it depends on your deployment, it depends on your application, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of more research about the actual uh, uh, performance improvements uh, have to be done. Um, so there were some, uh, there were some issues uh, in the beginning. So the RFC talked about opcache compile file, and then you have to figure out the, uh, the object graph or the inheritance yourself. Uh, so the Laravel and the Symfony just took a file and they, did, they used autoloading, so they, do, they, they did require. So the autoloading automatically knew what files it had to, it had to include. Um, but the, they more focused on the opcache compile file way than the require. So in the beginning, there were a lot of sec faults, but most of that has been, uh, has been fixed. Um, and there are uh, some um, issues in the bug tracker, but it's not that bad. Um, I think the previous version, the previous mi minor version, um, disabled preloading by default for Windows because Windows and memory does some crazy things. Um, so yeah, um, about performance. Is it worth the effort of using preloading? Um, well, it <laughs> depends on the situation. So you have, to, you have to figure it out. Also, you have to make, um, you know your application the best. Um, you know your application the best to know what files are really important for your application, what files that you want to have uh, there uh, immediately. Um, so yeah, stick with the hot classes. Don't uh, put everything into, uh, into memory. Um, and from, um, from a hosting perspective, we're now looking how we can do that, how we can uh, use all the information and start suggesting preloading files for customers, um, even try to uh, figure out the hot classes and then um, automatically adding a preload file for them um, and then see if we see uh, improvements. Um, so yeah, even if it's a small improvement, if you have a lot of accounts like we do, we see, uh, we see a lot of improvements uh, on the cluster overall. So if you want to see some more reports, uh, a lot of people are actually um, using preloading. Uh, the results are mixed. <laughs> so if you saw the results from the composer uh, output, that's from like half a year ago, that were very promising. The real life improvements um, are, yeah, they, they vary. So uh, some preloading resources, we have the um, internals uh, email, we have the preloading RFC, where you can still find most of the information about, uh, about preloading. And then we have the pull request, if you really want to see how they did it and see, have a look at the pull request. So in conclusion, um, about PHP performance, uh, know enough about your about the PHP internals, how does opcache work, how does how this all the all the loading works. Um, know how your application work, how your application works, and that depends a lot. So use the opcache catch status to get um, real time information about your application. If you have restarts, if you lose a lot of memory and stuff. If you then take that information, fine tune your settings, and then most important importantly, repeat because if you double the memory because your opcache is full and you have a huge application, you could have another full memory and you'd have to reiterate. So make sure that you, that you, keep, uh, that you keep inspecting your, uh, your performance. So one last point, what we do at, at Combell, we have an elastic stack and we um, gather for all our uh, customers, we gather all the data. So we have all the real path uh, opcode uh, statistics 
uh, we shove it all into uh, into Elastic, um, so that we can see uh, we can see what we can uh, what we can do about it. Um, like I said, it's changing constantly, so you have to repeat it a lot. Um, so we keep monitoring, and uh, if we see that size are full, um, we try to implement auto tuning so that we can increase memory, decrease memory, so that we uh, um, we can uh, even uh, we can uh, drop the loads on our uh, on our systems, uh, and then we're trying to figure out if we can do stuff with uh, preloading and auto configure uh, preloading. Um, and that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>